Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second keynote panel, this time in the APJ region. And today we're going to be talking about Security Champions programs, a very popular, trendy topic for people who are looking to really engage with development teams from security teams uh, and really increase that collaboration within their organization. So uh, joining me today, we have uh, we have Nick from uh, Pearson, uh, we have uh, Yash from uh, Twilio, and we have Marissa from Atlassian. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, folks introduce yourselves in just a second. But a couple of things uh, just to start off that we're going to be uh, talking about today. We're going to really be talking about security champions from the ground up. And that's going to be why, or first of all, what a security champions program is, why you might want to create one, how a security champions program works, and really what, what we can get out of it. Um, finally, we're going to end up with that hard question of, what does good look like? And that's always the challenging, challenging question. So why don't I go around the room here and uh, ask ask the folks to uh, introduce themselves and what they do at the at the uh, various companies. So uh, Yash, you're first on the on the list here. So why don't we uh, introduce you first? Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Simon. My name is Yash. I am the senior manager of product security at Twilio. My team basically is responsible for all the SSDLC activities that are performed within the company. Thank you, yes. And over to you, Nick. Hi, I'm Nick Vinson. I'm the head of DevSecOps at uh, Pearson. Um, and my role is, is the lead of a, um, a security engineering team and responsible for all security engineering activities across all of our um, product teams. Wonderful. And Marissa. Hi, everyone. Um, Marissa Fagan here. I am head of the trust, culture, and training team at Atlassian. And my team works directly with our team that, uh, and the product security team that really is in charge of the SSDLC as well. And uh, we also are uh, the team that kind of sponsors the Security Champions Program. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. We've got people who have been very involved uh, in Security Champions. And Marissa, you've uh, been involved with Security Champions for, for a number of different organizations. I'll, I'll, I'll start my first question um, with yourself. What is a Security Champions program to start off with? What, for people who have never heard of one, what's the, what's the, what's the reason? Uh, well, no, what is a Security Champion, first of all? Uh, so the Security Champions program is really the best win-win example of the relationship between the developer and the security professional. Um, so if there is a product security team or an application security program uh, that is working with developers, uh, this is the way that your developers can really accomplish a lot for security without uh, the security team having to be very uh, have all of that overhead of doing the security program by themselves. So that partnership between the developer team and the security team is going to uh, help accomplish a lot more for both sides. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who uh, previously uh, watched the first uh, panel, it, we were talking about rollout of security programs and Security Champions was briefly mentioned. It's, it's a great way of uh, using existing formal program to, to, to be able to roll out those new security uh, security programs. So that sounded pretty good to me, uh, Marissa. Anyone else got anything to add to that? Or uh, was that a pretty succinct uh, uh, description that covered it all? That was a good description. It was a good description, it was. Uh, so um, how about the benefits it can provide? So in terms of the goals of the champions, um, Yash, what, what, what do you uh, do at Twilio uh, in terms of what you want to achieve out of the program? Sure. So on a high level, we have champions on pretty much most of the engineering teams, and we have an engineer on the security team who's their dedicated point of contact. In terms of benefits, I look at it from like both directions, right? Like what do the engineering teams get out of it versus what does security get out of it? From a security perspective, we have a dedicated point of contact on the engineering team who we work with, build relationship with, know their product, so that when they're building a new feature or a service or making modifications, we get to review it in very early stages of their development lifecycle. So we can stop vulnerabilities uh, before they enter code and also influence good design practices. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any other benefits from uh, others here? From, uh... I think we, we use um, you know, security champions in a similar way, but our 
primary use is, you know, is, by, is to scale our security engineering function across all of our tech teams um, by yeah, providing that point of contact who we can treat as basically a conduit for training up in security practices. So they can then hopefully organically spread that knowledge throughout their team. So a team can be become self-sufficient for their own security. We treat, treat our core security engineering team much as a consulting function within the tech org, um, with the primary purpose of eventually having all of the developers feeling that they that security is their responsibility. But we just use the security champions as kind of a, an efficient means to deliver that. Mm. Okay, so in terms of the costs, I guess, that are associated, everything has their costs, whether it's monetary or, or people's time. Um, what, what are the, we can see the benefits that we are trying to get out of the program. How much does it cost in terms of time, people, uh, that kind of stuff? Um, Marissa, actually, as someone who's built big uh, programs in larger organizations, uh, I guess, from that scaling point, um, the costs build up, uh, I guess, is the, the, you know, the number of these uh, champions grow. So from your point of view, how does that look? Oh, I think you're on uh, mute, Marissa. Sure. So this is a people problem, and you need people to solve it. So your first uh, real cost is devoted headcount. Um, having a devoted program manager to run the operations and the care and feeding of the program uh, is really important, as well as having dedicated time from each of your product security engineers to be supportive to the team, uh, to your developers. That is really important and expensive. Having a, a dedicated amount of time, 10%, 20% of an engineer's time. And then on the developer side, um, anywhere between 10 and 20% of their time as well, devoted to working through security issues building security improvements and that sort of thing. Um, it can feel like an ambitious goal, but in order for the program to have longevity, you really need to be all in and mm -hmm. devote a substantial amount of time on every on both sides. Um, and then as well, there's sort of the incentives of the program that you could consider and incentives can have monetary budget. Um, you know, there's always a better program with better budget. Mm -hmm. um, in our program, we devote a lot of time to the incentives that we're offering um, and being sure that you're devoting um, resources to training uh, is important, as well as in our program, um, taking a look at how you can provide feedback to uh, the maybe the manager of your developer security champion uh, providing that feedback is time consuming, but it can really help when that security champion is looking to go for their uh, growth plan, their promotion review, that sort of thing. Having a concrete um, explanation of how they contributed to the security champions program can really help them out in the long term. And it's really uh, a sign that the company is investing in your security champions. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And I'd love to go to, back to your point in terms of having a dedicated program manager, because I find that very interesting. So obviously Atlassian, huge company, but how, at what stage or what growth stage does a, do you feel a dedicated person um, or dedicated role to be that program manager is 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 needed? I think uh, when, when you have it, you'll know. This happens organically <laughs> about the size of your program. Um, so you first need a, a, a person to own this and drive it. And um, that's probably going to start off as a product security engineer, somebody on that side. Um, but it quickly becomes a logistics issue and the operations of the program become something that a program manager has a, a, a more a, uh, experienced talent with running. So I think that you know you start very small uh, we'll probably talk to this a little bit more later, but starting a program, you start small and in your pilot, maybe that's just run with a few teams and a product security engineer. And that after pilot stage, the very next thing I would do is roll it over to a program manager for the uh, growth of the program. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's talk about the 
who needs to who needs to sponsor it? Who needs to who needs to back this in order for it to, I guess, be approved for an official program or for it to be rolled out uh, across an organisation? Um, Nick, well, in your experience, is this something that needs to happen from the top down and from an exec point down, or is this something that can organically grow from the bottoms up? Uh, I think ideally both. I think you want um, sort of top down backing and bottom up backing, but really, what's the most important will depend on your organisation. If you're a large old bureaucratic organization, having executive buy-in and sponsorship is gonna be the most important thing, um, especially when you're battling against different you know, different priorities, which are potentially still in some degree siloed um, and not completely aligned. So uh, you know, things like you know, security is not gonna, unfortunately still not gonna be the top priority for lots of development managers or program managers. So having that, you know, that executive buy-in at the SVP layer or the C level is is going to be key to make sure that security work actually gets prioritised um, within the projects and within the sprints. Um, but I think equally, if you're a, a small small company or a startup where basically what gets done is going to be driven by the engineers, then you need to have that bottom-up appreciation and, and importance for security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so let's say. Um... You know, we want to, we have, you know, whether or not we have this exec buy in this, you know, let's say we do want to create um, a security champions program from scratch. Um, Yash, how do we, how do we go about um, setting this up from, from, you know, ground zero? Do we, do we try and roll out quickly? Do we try and look at just one team? How do we start? I would say you probably would be better off starting off uh, with one organization as a POC in the company. Uh, show the value of it, build small, uh, celebrate smaller wins, and then showcase that effort. And if you can show metrics or data-driven sort of quantification of the program saying, we did the Champions POC with these five teams, this is what came out of it. That's why this is better for the whole company. And then use that to drive it across the company because eventually you need to show engineers and engineering leaders the value you get from engineers dedicating time to this program. If you are able to prove uh, with data that a statement uh, saying, please dedicate it, X percent of your engineering resources to a champions program, and this will be the result across the company. I think that makes a solid statement. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, do you feel, um, obviously, if you start with one group and then slowly, gradually uh, grow over time, um, do you feel there is an expect a faster expectation from um, an exec level or a management level about growing this faster, or do you find they're typically sympathetic to the speed at which this can realistically be rolled out? I think that's pretty much different per company, right? Like mm -hmm. if there is exec buy-in and you're talking about uh, something that needs to be rolled out, then that's a very different pace versus the other bottoms up approach where you're trying to show value and grow it organically. So it varies on what the security philosophy is and what the appetite for security eventually is. Mm -hmm. Cool. Why don't we jump into the details then about what, um, how a security champions program looks and, and what are the kinds of activities um, that, that we can jump into. So, um, Marissa, why don't we talk about the structure of a group? How have you, how are you typically um, structured groups? You mentioned uh, about having individuals on both sides. How, how does it look uh, from a structure point of view? Um, I think that the structure obviously can vary. Every program is different. And so you take the pieces that are going to best suit your culture. Um, so, uh, a setup that I've seen in a couple of places is having a process for identifying who your security champions should be and a decision, are you going to make this a requirement at some level for teams to participate or not? Um, my, I, the most successful programs I've run have sort of a requirement in there. And as a result of that, your security champions are nominated by a manager from their team and you're looking um, in in the more mature stages of your program, you're looking for like 100% adoption from all the teams. So you're really needing a way to make the program official so that it can be handed to people, rolled out, the requirements are understood and uh, there's sort of a, a list of roles and responsibilities. 
And then you've got your list of roles and responsibilities. Do not deviate from that list. Don't scope creep and you know, stop by the desk here and there and say, oh, and also there's this program. And could we add this to the list? Uh, the, the element of trust is really important between the security champions and the uh, security team that is um, sp sponsoring. Uh, so having a very set structure is the most important part. Uh, and then from there, you can have either a one-to-one -one setup or you can do one-to-many. So in the sense, in the example where you have a program manager, there's one program manager and that one program manager would support uh, one to a dozen product security engineers. And then those one to a dozen product security engineers each themselves support one to five uh, security champions. And that's sort of a pyramid structure. Uh, and I find that that has the best leverage to get um, real relationships built, people that know actual people, and it's not just uh, the security team as a whole, kind of a, um, you know, without a face. So having personal relationships, uh, of course, when you're trying to build a culture program, it's all about people getting to know people and helping each other. And in my experience, when a security champion is deciding just how much energy and effort they're going to put into a program, it often does come down to a personal connection to uh, the goals and to the program. So those sorts of things can be built and intentionally supported and nurtured. Mm, very interesting. One, one, one point that you mentioned that that kind of like uh, I, I was very interested there early on was the was the the coverage that you've got, obviously is probably close to or if not 100% across Atlassian, right? If you have, if, if you, if it's more people get, um, it's almost like selected uh, by their management organization to be a part of that team, uh, or presumably the manager will ask people if they're interested in if you know, if someone's there, that's, mm -hmm. that's desperate to be in it, they'll, they'll, they'll give it to that person. How, how do you see that working in terms of pros and cons of it being more organic opt-in versus the managers uh, designating this uh, security champion to individuals? Um, well, the pro is that you're solving for one of the biggest issues in the security space, which is scale. And you're getting better scale, better coverage of your landscape and code base by actually having somebody on the ground in each coding, you know, each development team. Um, so coverage is kind of, uh, it's the starting goal. It's the reason for the program as far as the security team is concerned. Um, and then on the kind of expensive side, I, I won't call it a, a negative, is the just the amount of work that is required also expands exponentially. When you're involving more people, you need to create a um, experience for each of these people. And when you have more types of personas in your group, you have to create more, uh, you have to broaden your experience so that it fits more types of roles. Mm. And that can be- How does this, uh, absolutely. How does this contrast with, um, uh, Yash, Nick, your your programs are they are they similarly built? Um, I think, I think the key one of the key requirements for us in terms of the effectiveness of the of the security champion is if they're already a contributing member of that team. Then really important for them to be able to to be able to independently now to make changes and push them through um, you know the pipelines and get them deployed into into production for those products. Um, where we've had problems is where you know a team has been kind of identified they need to have a security champion and, and try to bring in an external re or new resource and then it still takes time to get them familiar up and running with that team so i think existing contributing members of those teams is the most effective way to do this um just a quick comment on, on cost as well i think it's actually you know security champions program it depends on your company's attitude to security but if you know it's something which is important you need to do it's actually a cost saving, saving um, mechanism because I, presumably you started out with a security engineering function that's scaling up 
hiring security engineers, embedding them in, in each team is just is not practical, and definitely not cost effective. Um, I think it's also easier to, to have an effective security champions program if you've already started that initial you know, start having that existing security engineering function and have done it on a smaller scale by embedding security engineers into teams or liaising between different teams because you'll already have your engagement model so you'll understand you'll set up what that ssdrc looks like and that makes it much easier to put into an easy training package to roll out and, and teach the um, security champions very similar at Julio. I'll add on top of both what Marissa and Nick said. Um, the individuals who become champions, it is sort of semi uh, voluntary plus manager led as well. A couple of uh, soft requirements that we have is that they should have been a part of the team to what Nick said, that they should have been somebody who knows how things are deployed, how things are built. The other thing that we ask is the member is not like a very junior member of the team because if it's a senior or semi-senior member, they know what other members of that engineering team are working on versus some of the junior teams may not have as much visibility to be able to represent all the work being done by the whole team from a security perspective. So that's the slight change that I would uh, point out that we do here at Twilio. Couple of other things that we do very similarly, but a little differently here is we don't have uh, program management support, which agreed is nice to have, but we have been running a program where we don't uh, have that yet. We have security engineers dedicating, or specifically product security engineers dedicating around 40% of their time towards champions. And from these champions, like a lot of reviews sort of stem down, right? Threat models, code reviews, pen tests, and so on and so forth. Uh, from the engineering perspective, to Marissa's point, it's very important to document the set of responsibilities that's expected from both the champion and the security engineer who's their point of contact. And then set those expectations to the engineer, to the engineering leadership saying, this is what we expect of a champion. We estimate that to take 10, 15% of the engineer's time. And this is what um, we get out of that and to stick to that and not have a scope creep. And, and that's that's why on. you need the executive support, right? To be able to say, we want 10%, 15%, 20%. Has anyone experienced champions programs where you haven't been able to get that agreed 10, 20% from a developer's uh, time? We haven't had the exact problem, but we need to keep showing value from the program in order to keep that question from raising up. I don't think you can always keep going like, okay, give us 10% of your time, but we'll never quantify or show what's happening through it. So in terms of metrics, number of threat models that come up, code reviews, like if you can quantify what activities are being performed and what that eventually leads to. Uh, as an example, you could say, we did a champions program with two orgs or two business units that led to X percent higher threat model findings compared to the other organizations in which we had more pen test or bug money submissions and sort of correlate those and say we're finding issues faster and uh, before in the SDLC cycle versus later after release. And the difference is one has a beefed up champions program and the other doesn't. I think that's how you get that buy. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk a little bit about the activities that actually occur in in uh, a champions program or, or, or at least between the the uh, champions and their their equivalents coaches or mavens or um uh, i don't know trainers or, or however we choose to call them on the security side um there are going to be regular activities that have a cadence and there are going to be activities that just generally happen um marissa what what in alassian what, what are the types of activities that are are structured um, versus other activities that that you've seen happen as a result of just having a champions program there. Um, so having the security champions take on more of the security team's responsibilities. Um, anytime that you can add one of those practices to the security champion set because it's matured in a way that it is uh, documented and understandable, then and anyone that is close to the code could run those operations, that's going to be much better. So having, um, first of all, starting with training 
uh, a set baseline training. And then we see that kind of as the kind of a driver's license, um, the driver's license training to get the keys to getting uh, firsthand and therefore a shorter timeline uh, firsthand experience with running some of these security um, security testing operations. So uh, having a, some amount of security testing, scanning, those sorts of things, and then those generate the uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, if you can include some first level triage and remediation of the vulnerabilities themselves, uh, imagine the time you can save by cutting down the um, when, uh, so you have a vulnerability in the code and keeping it with the developer, keeping it with the code's owner and not having it travel all the way across the world sometimes to the security team, having them look at it and then sending it back for um, in remediation. It's saving a lot of time there. So uh, taking the, um, some of those security activities. Also looking at threat modeling. Um, this is a lightweight threat model, not necessarily that same level that a security professional would be able to deliver. But when we notice a pattern that is consistent across many of the teams, that's something that we can build into a lightweight security champion customized threat modeling process that they can run in the beginning and during the life cycle of their code and it really helps to, again, just shorten the amount of time that each code set has to uh, be dealing with the security process. Um, and then also, let's see. Um, and then there is an official amount of kind of community interaction that is an expectation is set for. So we have a monthly meeting and there is an expectation that you will participate in the monthly meeting and participate in all of the conversations around uh, tickets and incidents that are set for your team. So that is another piece that's kind of, uh, and there's an official expectation that is uh, time spent. And what is that monthly meeting? Is that is that kind of like a sync meeting between champions or a way for the security team to communicate through throughout the community? What's the uh, content of those? Yeah, there's announcements, anything that needs to be communicated about changes to the program. So that kind of level of speaking to everyone all at once is really helpful to have once a month. But then there's also um, that is one of the opportunities for training and maybe there's a vulnerability of the month and we are just running through uh, taking one vulnerability class at a time and running through uh, examples of real examples of the vulnerability in our code base and um, then also there's an expectation that security champions themselves will teach back and present at this same meeting um, so when they're finding interesting bugs themselves, this is the opportunity to showcase their work and improvement and how they're growing as security champions as well. So we get a lot done in that one monthly meeting. Yeah, sounds good. Nick, I know you do like um, school card assessments and things like that. that is that part of the um, security champions program? Yeah, so yeah, so I think that's what I'm saying. I think it's really important to, to clearly define what it is that we are asking the security champions to do and what their responsibilities are. Um, so part of that will be, um, yeah, uh, filling out filling out school cards for the, um, yeah, for, for the operational security testing stats. Um, I think first and foremost, and there is, you know, what I think the responsibility is is to help the team in identifying what the security requirements are for new functionality coming in. Um, so they'll be doing that um, by by threat modeling, um, and that's how our, our security team will help ease them into that by. Know, one of the security engineers will carry out the initial threat model for the for whatever that application or product is, um, but then uh, train the uh, security champion in that threat modeling process so that as new functionality is added, they can go and update that threat model with uh, with with any new security threats and requirements, um, so it becomes much more manageable. Um, alongside, um, you know, supporting all of the the team with uh, all of the security detection and remediation activities, um, which is why you're training them in how to triage, um, you know, secure static analysis and dependency scanning results, dynamic analysis, and turn those into bodies of, 
you know, a body of work for the team to be able to implement or have the security champions go and implement it themselves. Anything to add there, Yash? Is, there, is it similar similar at Twilio? Uh, pretty similar. What we do is we have documentation of who's the security champion for which team and who's the dedicated uh, security partner. We also have a wiki page that shows the work that's pending on the champions teams uh, side of from security activities and also from the security team of the activities that are uh, that they are performing for that particular team. So the security champions sort of uh, widget of tickets could be fix X, fix Y, fix Z. And on the security side, it could be do a threat model, go look at this, go review this PR. So it's kind of uh, holding each other accountable, uh, engineering team saying, hey champion, we need your team to do these five activities. And on the flip side, hey security engineer, since you're our POC, I need you to do these three activities for me, right? So it kind of keeps that visibility going. We also have a Slack channel per security champions, security engineer working relationship, because what we found out was uh, people move teams, people move organizations pretty fast, and then that context is lost. So having one place where everything's recorded, all the consultation notes and the conversations are there, it's easy for somebody new on either side to go up, scroll through and look up like, okay, this is a conversation that's been had in the last three months. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a meeting with between the champion and the engineer and the security engineer once every two or three weeks, depending on the workload. And that kind of results in, okay, we're changing the color of this web page. It doesn't need a threat model. We're building this new feature that requires a threat model. So those are sort of the documented activities that we do. Um, some of the undocumented, con not consequences, but undocumented things that happen are security engineers get tagged on PR saying, hey, we work together. Here's a PR that I think needs security review. Take a look. So we don't officially do security PR reviews, but it just happens with the flow because of the relation that is built on a one-to-one -one basis here. And in terms of training, we rolled out a advanced champions program of sorts. So to Marissa's point, there's sort of this baseline training that is required as a driver's license to be a champion. But on top of it, we also sort of released a red, blue, purple kind of tracks where we say, okay, if you pick red, we'll help you do offensive stuff. We'll let you be a part of one of the red team activities. We'll let you do X, we'll let you do Y. And then blue becomes the defensive and purple. Uh, I know the industry standard sort of the combination of red and blue, but since we're a cloud native uh, cloud first company, we made that into a cloud training um, or a cloud security sort of uh, theme where we got the cloud security team to come in, do a in-person training, do some uh, ad hoc challenges. Like uh, there are a bunch of, uh, insecure cloud AWS hosted challenges out there. So we kind of compiled all of those into a training material even, and then sort of get people through it. And that gives them privileges to do certain activities like approving subsets of firewalls from a security perspective, which were originally intended to be done only by the security engineer. So we've talked about a lot and for for a lot of activities, a lot of different things we could do through the Security Champions program. And for someone who's, um, you know, thinking about starting up a, a Security Champions program from scratch, it could maybe be a little bit overwhelming, particularly for developers. You wouldn't necessarily want to push everything to a development team at once. I'd like I'd love to hear from each of you here and, and we'll start with uh, Yas. Um, what would you start with if there was one activity, one thing you would like to push through a Security Champions program? Is it org specific, company specific, or, or is there something that you have found most successful with that engagement through development teams? I would start something which is tangible, and that could differ from company to company. If you're talking about a uh, fairly new security program and you're starting off, so some of the first few activities that you could do is talk about new features they're building and do a lightweight threat model. I think something important is not to keep adding a lot of work as part of the champions program to overwhelm people. So keeping it simple, keeping it small could be a lightweight threat model, could be as simple as, uh, Security champion's responsibility is to make sure that all the security tooling, SAS, dependency, DAS are integrated into that team's pipelines. Uh, so start off with like one or two activities and keep ramping up from there.
or meet Simon. Sorry, there we go. Uh, Marissa, any, any thoughts from you about uh, some of the activities you would start with initially? Uh, after this conversation, I want to change my answer to <laughs> what Yash was saying. I love this idea of having a Slack channel for each conversation for the relationship that can maybe be handed over as an artifact. Uh, so I think I would start there. And what I would hope to get out of it is um, once introductions are made and the expectations are set, uh, something that would be great to start with is if security champions could reach out to the security team every time a new project is started that has security implications and apply that spidey sense to this um, and then create just a very brief risk assessment questionnaire that's like three questions and toss that into the Slack when a, a new project is started. What visibility that would give our, our organization, that would be great. Yeah, and I think uh, it would be doable. One of the things as well I love about that kind of like a Slack organization is that it turns it almost from a from a program into a community where you get your individuals in there talking to each other straight away and and not necessarily needing to wait for a specific event or anything like that. Um, and it really lowers that bar for people to just reach out because likely you're going to be using Slack anyway in your organization, so you just you know ping them straight away or whatever. Um, uh, Nick, any any anything you wanted to add? Yeah. I I completely agree on, on, on Slack, although we're limited to Teams, but in, in a similar vein, I think especially as we've got our security teams flat and has a, has a mix of different different um, expertise and skill sets, being able to reach out, reach out for different people easily and quickly for something is a, is a, is a, yeah, is a massive efficient, efficiency um, benefit. Um, I think I, to be honest, exactly what exactly what Yash said is, is, is what our priorities are for, for the initial steps of a, you know, a new security champion. It's being there to help identify what the security requirements are for that project and especially starting small um you know first of all it's helping get all the information from that about that project and any relevant domain knowledge to the security engineer who's supporting that to help effectively throughout model it and then eventually when when the security champions got up to speed it throughout modeling to be able to do that independently as well as obviously making sure that they're able to integrate all the security testing tools and that they're working effectively first. Awesome. Well, would you believe it? We only have a few minutes left and I, I want to talk about an important point before I kind of ask you all for your final, for your final takeaway. Um, and, and that point is really um, in and around uh, what individuals, what members of the security champions program actually get out themselves and i want to i know there are obviously security team benefits as well but i feel like it's important here to focus on the development teams um now now marissa you, you mentioned incentives uh briefly earlier i'd love you to expand on that because i feel like there are going to be some perhaps uh career incentives as well as other types of incentives um how do you what, what are the benefits uh from the developer's point of view of a program of being part of a program like that and and talk us through more of the incentives yeah so in addition to what we've been talking about which is team velocity you know being able to complete projects faster because you're closer to the security review um you also get a training and experience in a different area that can just bolster your, uh, your your resume, your your growth plan, getting more experience cross team. Um, I know at our company, this sort of cross team collaboration with other parts of the organization is great for building up your career profile. And so that building up investing in the individual really helps. Um, and then also, uh, if you can, the just the fun stuff, swag, having a team logo and doing hoodies, that sort of thing. Um, it helps to create the culture of the program. Absolutely, a strong sense of belonging as well, being people being part of something, et cetera. Anything else uh, anyone wants to add in terms of the incentives or? I have something to add. Nick, go on, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'd just be quick. So Ed, I think uh, it, 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 honestly, it, we haven't really need to offer incentives because I think the, the security champions who've nominated themselves and have an interest in security, they've, they've just been expanding that interest and developing it more. So especially, you know, I think it's, it's really good to see some some of this, you know, security champions just pet bugging me saying, oh, you know, one of my engineers showed them this, please can I have a BERT license so I can start doing it myself. Um, so I think, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think the, the kind of 
incentives are already, are already there if there's an interest in security. I think something else which, you've also, which is also a positive thing is to, to it's just that nature of some competitiveness. So being able to put some, some leaderboards up for you know, security posture in particular environments, because obviously there's a, there's a pride in that and, and, and wanting to be near the top there for each team to see their, their, you know, the, their cloud environments and their um, application um, code base being as, up there as secure as possible. Um, I have two things to add. One, I would agree with what both of them have said in terms of the career growth of the individual who's a champion, right? Like putting that on your resume that I've worked on security issues, I was a security sort of point of contact for this team. That's really great addition. Uh, the other thing that we do, and this helps sort of intense incentivize the program for the individuals plus the engineering management as well, is certain activities that have, are reserved for security could be a PR plus one, could be a firewall plus one, could be anything of the, that nature, right? If you can find a subset of those and say security champions who have done X, Y, and Z trainings or who have done X, Y, and Z activities will now be able to approve these things that only security was able to approve. And that combined with finding vulnerabilities and issues early on in the SDLC kind of helps make your build and deploy process much faster uh, than the traditional way where it'd be like, okay, design, build, wait for an approval for a day, then a pen test, then go back and make some changes, right? So you take all of those uh, friction points for the engineers out and say, have a beefed up champion or multiple champions. You get to approve some of your own things. You get to know the security stuff you need to fix before. And you, you can just move at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. So that's the other sort of incentive we sell as part of the program. Yeah, I love that. Speeding It speeds up development rather than slows it down, which is an important thing. Very, very briefly then, just to finish off, um, I'd love for each of you to to um, tell me about what your greatest takeaway is from this session uh, or best practice that you would uh, advise someone would uh, follow. Why don't we start with you, uh, Yash? Cool. Uh, my takeaway is that our uh, thoughts about the Champions program are shared across the industry and not sort of siloed to the companies. So it's sort of a word of confidence from other members of the industry saying, yes, this works and we use it too. Awesome. Marissa? Uh, for me, it's incorporating a security questionnaire, a quick security review, empowering developers to take on more of their security activities by creating a kind of handoff or a um, driver's license where you're empowering them to take ownership of the things because they own the code. So you're just that shifting left strategy to move the security activities closer to where the code actually lives. I love that with the developers taking ownership. It's very powerful for sure. Yeah. And Nick. I think probably the, the most important thing for security champions program is, is the security champions themselves. So it's, it's making sure you've got the right people there, the ones that've got, you know, knowledge of that, of the, their team of their product and the background in that tech stack and are really passionate you know, about and wanting to learn more about security. Um, that's, what we seem to be the most effective and important thing. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. It's been, well, this time has flown. We're a touch over, but uh, thank you very, very much. Conversation has been excellent. So uh, Yash, Marissa, Nick, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And for our viewers out there, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks all. Thank you.